reading from Isaiah, the fifth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved has a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones, and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yield wild, wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed. And it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no more upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant plantings. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed and righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Be to God. I read Psalm 80 responsively. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You cleared the ground for it, but it took root and filled the land. You stretch out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Behold, and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. The reading is from Philippians, the third chapter, beginning at the fourth verse. Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a prosecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through the faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward on what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for, I ha for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Listen 
to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenant seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, the landowner sent other slaves, more than the first time, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, the landowner sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. But when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because the crowds regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Pastor Sue Briner of our bishop's office met with your council on August 6th. One of the areas she encouraged us to focus on at in this fall time was in growing our generosity. So hence, lest you be wondering why you got homework last Sunday, um, but your homework assignment was to be attentive for where you experienced a story of God's generosity this week. I wondered, any, anybody come with a story? Okay, well, you can continue the assignment for next week. How's that? You thought I was going to put you off the hook. Oh, you got one. Wonderful story of generosity. God's, very small. 
It started yeah. very small yeah. and became yeah. something significant. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate that. God's generosity, it's out there. Because God is out there and at work in its everyday life. Let us pray. Good and generous God, let your word be generous in our ears and in our reflection. Speak your word, your word that brings life in the world, your word that brings healing and hope. For it is a word that brings resurrection and forgiveness and new life. So let now the words in my mouth and the listening and the reflection of all who hear be acceptable in your sight, our Savior and our Redeemer. Amen. For our text today, I wanted to zero in on a couple of verses out of our reading from Philippians. Where Paul writes, Paul who's in prison, writes to the community of Philippi. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, based on faith. So the subject for our time together this morning is God's generosity in an I earned it culture. You know that it's all my doing. And so it's all mine to hold on to or to share it if I want. I wonder what's your family story around generosity? How is your family story told? One of the defining stories for me comes out of my father's side. Not too far east of here in Washington County, my father was the youngest of 10. His father died when he was a very young teen in the mid 30s. Those of you who are wondering, that's well before I was born. <laughs> not that old. And then in the post depression years, They lost the family farm and their home. I heard the story with tears in his eyes from my dad many times. Even as when we were children, took us to see that farm was ours. And we lost it. They farmed with their mother for a while, my grandmother who I never got to know, but I certainly have heard about her. She died about 10 days after I was born. And they lost the farm and the family, and they farmed off their mother to take turns living with different siblings. And I remember well my dad saying, the day came when he and his older brother, I think my dad was 15 or 16, said, well, we have a home no more. We've got nowhere to go but up. And off they went to the city. Why tell that story? Because I often fear, or at least sense, that the culture in many of our Lutheran communities is embedded like mine in Northern European immigrant stories. But often told now by immigrants that didn't lose the land and 
arose into the life of middle class America and the stuff of maybe moderate success. I'm reminded of that story today. Because looking in the mirror, I'm reminded of how I too get imprisoned in those invisible jail walls inside of consumerism and the appetite for more stuff. But yet amidst my grandmother, and what little they had, and even less they had as their life proceeded, I also continued to hear stories of her deep and profound faith. An interesting and timely combination for us in this story from the letter, actually not story, background story, but from the letter of Paul, where Paul is imprisoned by the Roman Empire. And we can imagine perhaps all of the deprivation that came with the first century imprisonment. His writing in that context sounds to be totally the antithesis of success or generosity. You heard what he wrote. For his sake, for Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish. Now I want to talk a little bit, put on a teacher's head, this word of rubbish. It's a bit of a sanitized translation. The actual Greek word, I don't read in Greek too much, but I look to confirm this. It only appears once in the Bible, this word, because it's a dirty word. Skubala. There's good reason it's only used once. Now, rubbish translation might suggest to you, you know, wrapping paper from the bag of Halloween cappy candy you bought to put in the bowl to get ready for trick-or-treaters. Or it might remind you of rubbish that comes with the milk carton or the plastic containers for your Sunday morning bulletin or from the munch and meat that happens at 10 o'clock or unused bulletins. But the liter literal translation, here's the bad word warning, is for what goes into the commode. Now, they didn't have commodes in the first century. So it was part of their everyday experience. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as, OK, not the S word, not the C word, but, OK, excrement. All right? I count it all as rubbish, excrement. I trust that you've never heard that word from the pulpit before. <laughs> that all these kind of things we do and lift up perfect Sunday school attendance pins, perfect worship attendance, a tither, or any of our contemporary metrics, I trust you've never heard it said, consider it all as excrement. Paul goes on to write about all those things marketed to him as the essence of religion. I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own, but one that comes through faith in Christ. And then he names off a list 
of phrases, a string of gifts that come to him in Christ, and they're all, almost all of them, in the passive tense. We have an English teacher in the midst. So active tense is what I've done, what I've contributed. Passive tense, what somebody else has done, and I receive and then. Also often, we talk about what we've done, what we deserve. But Paul calls us to the gospel of a generous God. In your bulletin today, perhaps you notice the next pondering generosity piece for you. Jesus in our life turns our values upside down. What we used to treasure no longer holds sway over us. Instead of material possessions, we may prize our relationships, healthy and spiritual life. For faith works on us to make us stewards of all that is truly valuable. I discovered a new uh, resource this past week and a new reference to a work titled The Paradox of Generosity. The Paradox of Generosity. Subtitled Giving We Receive and Grasping we lose. It's done by a couple of sociologists out of their research. And I share a few of those snippets with you. How are we to cope with an unfortunate cultural trend, the Grinch mentality, where we seek our own security and happiness by turning away from neighbors to hunker down and hoard only for ourselves. What can well-meaning, faithful Christians do? We lead the way. Because the way to overcome and to combat some of this anxiety, the secret for curing and dealing with the chronic anxiety caused by things like fear and scarcity Anxiety caused by choice and narcissism. The secret to defeating that anxiety is generosity. What we know is that our giving matters. Our giving makes our lives better because it makes the lives of those around us better. And science proves what our faith has always known. The more we give, the more free space opens us, opens up in us, giving God more room to live in us. That drove me to remember and look back at the second article of Luther's Catechism. Some of you probably can recite the words by heart yet. The section on I believe in Jesus Christ. And Luther includes a reference to silver and gold. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, has redeemed me. Here comes undeserved generosity a lost and condemned human being. How? Not with silver or gold. How? With the gift of his, the death and suffering of Jesus Christ. Well, yesterday came my experience of the power of generosity. I had the privilege of hearing 
via a ninth grader. Now let's surface a minute your stereotype of ninth graders. Okay, can you picture long hair, yada, 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 and you're going like, whatever. But I didn't know he's the ninth grader. I was wandering in the food pantry, and I sat down to talk to this person. I said, so where do you go to college? And he goes, I'm in the ninth grade, sir. And I said, well, what brought you here to the food pantry to volunteer today? And he went into some of that backstory, which I won't uh, share with you. Um, but he said, I said, well, I'm sorry I didn't know you, but it's my first time to wander here in the food pantry. He said, well, it's my first time, too. And we talked a little bit about what brought him there. And uh, I was thinking, ninth grader, this is where you choose to spend your Saturday morning? Volunteering in a food pantry? Nine to 12? My stereotype of ninth graders is something different, <coughs> like still in bed, waiting for mom to wake them up yeah. for lunchtime or something like that. And he reflected a little bit about the experience. It's my first time, but he said, but I want to come back. And I said, so this helping others accompany them through to fill their, to put things in their basket so they can have something to eat? That means something to you? Yeah, that, that spoke to me. That touched me. It was a powerful glimpse for me of God's generosity in unexpected places. The God of imprisoned Paul. And the God disclosed to us in the crucified Jesus invites us into upside down values, Saturday mornings and other times and places. So Paul asks the question for us what is our scubula? And what is value? What is rubbish and what is God's doing abundantly disclosed to us in the grace of Jesus Christ? It all begs the question and the challenge of us living a life of generosity with our time, with our talents, with our treasures. And along the way, this gospel invites us into a whole lot less anxious life because we are saved and given life, not a righteousness of our own, but what comes from a deepening trust in God, revealed for us in the waters of baptism, in bread and wine at table, in word that continues to turn the world upside down and breaks open our prison walls. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in God's grace now and always.